What's going on guys? This is Empty Box, and racing games indeed suck. This is a response to two videos I watched recently here on YouTube that I largely agree with, but I felt there was something missing. That being the how. How did we end up in a place where we either get a racing sim more focused on thermonuclear tire models and simulation value than a polished experience, Gran Turismo Take 37, and the yearly F1 and NASCAR games? Oh, and whatever indie games are left carrying the torch, half of which are in that first category. This isn't intended as a thorough history video, so I won't be talking about every last game, but rather just a select few games I think were truly hugely impactful in how they lead into where racing games as a whole are today. So let us begin. At its core, racing is really, really, really simple. You really just need a car and a stopwatch or some competition in some form or capacity and ideally a way to control the car with a steering wheel and some pedals. Although you could technically use a joystick, but it really makes the experience better with a wheel. Because racing actually really is pretty darn simple once you distill it, that was actually to the benefit of the racing game genre right out of the gate, as it helped the games actually resemble racing on the very limited hardware of the day. Pole Position was released in 1982 and its sequel was released in 1983. For reference, Pac-Man released in 1981, Tetris hadn't been unleashed upon the world, Mario just became known as Mario after a name change, Space Invaders was basically 90% of the games out there but just slightly different flavors and skins, it, it was basically all the same game anyways. Sports games didn't even really look like the sport that they were trying to replicate unless you like looked from across the room and squinted really hard and said, Oh, that's basketball, clearly. Meanwhile, Pole Position had gorgeous graphics for the time. You had real tracks, the best that could be done. <laughs> I mean, it's I mean, it's technically accurate, but it's also kind of a little bit of a, eh, you know, I'm not sure it counts. But more importantly, steering wheel, pedals, shifter. You had a machine that was cutting edge and designed to eat quarters just like with reckless abandon. It must have felt like an absolute quantum leap in gaming at the time. And when you look at it this way, I hope it's clear where I'm going here. Because racing games for a large portion of gaming history really were at the forefront of gaming. Enter the kings of arcade racing, Sega. In no particular order, OutRun. Basically pole position, but slathered in a glorious, bright 1980s vibe that's just so iconic. Hang on. Outrun or pole position, but with motorcycles and a, a motorcycle controller. Yes, that's the thing. Virtual Racing, a game that I'm pretty sure every kid thought had better graphics than real life at the time because, while this game's still a little bit before my time, I remember being blown away whenever I'd see this thing. It, it, just the graphics. But of course, there is the one, the only. Arguably the most iconic arcade racing game ever. If not one of the greatest arcade games ever, and in any genre, period. This is where arcade racing games finally come to the point that it's a fully mature package. A fusion of the wonderfully fun color palette of OutRun with the cutting edge graphics of virtual racing and gameplay that was clearly refined over the last decade of arcade racing games. Everything about this game just says fun. Everything about this game just says play me. Spend your quarters here. It's bright, it's colorful, it's wild, it's exciting, it's bombastic with the over the top, the attract mode and the rolling start thing. Uh, yes. You know, it's a game that now, decades later, still looks good thanks to the great art direction that was plotted. And then you pair that with what is probably everyone's first encounter with a force feedback steering wheel and pedals and a shifter and all that stuff. And you had a game that was just, 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 yes. There's a reason why this game was so immensely popular because it was so ahead of its time. And then, of course, you get into the downstream effects after Daytona USA, that being Sega just continued to pile on arcade racing game greatness with games like Sega Rally and Scud Race, or Super GT, I guess, here in America, because 
Scuds didn't sell well. For you younger generation out there, Scuds were ballistic missiles, so I'm not sure why they ever thought that was going to go well, but you know, hey. Oh, did I mention that these games always had, like, multiple cabinets, so y you could play multiplayer with your, your friends, with your buddies, with randos at the arcade, and, like, it was fun, and it was a social environment right there. It was, it was like online multiplayer, but without the online thing. It was really weird. People actually did things together. Remember those days? Sure, half my audience doesn't remember those days. I miss arcades. Anyways, by the mid-90s, the home console had firmly established itself as a part of the living room. However, it still really hadn't had something to close the gap quite yet to the arcades. In terms of racing games, besides Mario Kart, which really is much more of a party game than a racing game, there really wasn't anything out there that wasn't really just a poor version of an existing arcade machine. However, the gap in power between the big arcade machines and the home consoles was starting to close, and by the time the PlayStation arrived on scene, the days were numbered, Ridge Racer in particular being an early shot across the bow. And while it was a bit later and downstream of all this stuff, I need to mention the effects of the Sega Dreamcast here, because I do think it is a pretty big factor in terms of where racing games are today, believe it or not. This was a machine that was well ahead of its time, but it was a failure nonetheless. It was a money pit Hail Mary that would eventually knock Sega from contenders in the market to remember when they actually had good games. It's also worth mentioning that Sega AM2, the studio behind many of those absolute god-tier racing games in the arcades, would be busy working on Shenmue, a game that is unique and was very costly. So really, for the arcades, by the mid-90s, the writing was on the wall. By the late 90s, it was written on the wall, but this time in red. But something really big happened to the arcade racer's reign, so let's back up to one game for a moment. Gran Turismo wasn't the first to feature real cars. It wasn't the first to have customization. It wasn't the first racing sim, if you'd even dare call it a racing sim back then. Arguably the greatest, the world's never seen this before, feature as far as I'm aware, is the license test. But rather than just drive sports cars and supercars around like was normal in run-of-the-mill racing games, no. Econo boxes were a feature. Freed from the arcade, empowered by what was possible at home now, Gran Turismo blazed its own path. Without having to eat quarters and the limited memory usage of cartridges up to that time, Gran Turismo featured a car list that was simply gargantuan back then compared to any other racing game you've ever seen. The music was great, and in CD quality nonetheless. The graphics were actually really pretty darn good for anything that you're going to have in your home, and one of the earliest wax at deeper car customization with all the tuning and tweaking and all that stuff and then basically you double the car list because everything had a racing modification. It was great. This game wasn't possible in the arcade. It wasn't possible on any other platform at the time. It sold a bajillion and a half copies and then some, largely because it was a massive, massive leap in what was possible, and it took the racing game genre from, well, this is what racing games are, to here's Gran Turismo. And here, all these years later, Gran Turismo is still with us because it's kind of a big deal. What the original Gran Turismo was is really the first modern racing game. It pushed the limits well and truly, and boy did it pay off. And this is really where, in my opinion, the golden era of home racing games really started. Development takes time, investment takes time, the studios to go out there and say, hey, we should make a racing game because racing games can be successful, there's a little bit of a lag time. And that lag time was going to put us really close to the very end of the PlayStation 1, as well as the PlayStation 2. Your favorite racing game probably comes from this era, unless it happens to have the word Forza in it, in which case it's basically one of these games but slightly different. That's all there is to it. Not hating, we'll come to that a little bit later on. Alright, so back burning that one before you start the hate comment train. But this was a great time for gaming in general, and in particular racing games as well. And I want to touch on the why here, because this is a key part of where we are today. Let's just start by mentioning that racing games were already popular back then. 
Games like Gran Turismo and the Sega Arcade games were immensely popular. If you liked racing games, you aren't a weirdo like you are today. You are just a run-of-the-mill gamer. That's definitely important to keep in mind. Racing games had mass market appeal at the time because racing games were popular. And on the business side, these games weren't nearly as expensive as to develop as they have become, largely because the systems themselves were so limited, particularly with graphics and audio and features that you could pack into them. There was only so many polys the system could push, so there was no need to go all out creating them in near-perfect detail. This really meant that there was more room for freedom for the developers, which is pretty darn important when it comes to making interesting games that actually try different things. And because there's so many different games in the market, the developers really did things to try and differentiate the product because the publishers wanted their product to actually stand out on the shelves to be successful. Competition is a great thing. And if you don't believe that and you're too tied up emotionally to racing games, just go ahead and look at Madden, you know, the NFL games. They used to be really great in this era because there was competition. And then EA had the exclusive license for however long and still does. And now that franchise is absolutely hot trash. Or alternatively, the FIFA games. That's probably more relevant worldwide. Competition makes the games better. And this was largely the era before exclusivity, which meant that, for example, you had three different NASCAR games on the shelves at the same time. I mean, they're roughly around the same time. I, I didn't look them up, but, you know, NASCAR Thunder, NASCAR Dirt to Daytona, NASCAR Racing 2003 season, you know, any one of those games you could go ahead and say are the greatest NASCAR racing game ever created, and they were all more or less on the shelves at the same time time because they were all competing against one another i mean the only one that was really quite different was nascar racing 2003 season but still you know you, you had choices you had options but during this generation that would change you know i can think of two particularly massive things that were really really problematic for the racing game going forward first of all Electronic Arts and the licensing deal with Porsche, which meant that no game other than an Electronic Arts game was going to have a Porsche in it. Which, when you have one of the world's biggest, most popular, most recognizable car brands simply missing from every other game, it's really kind of weird. And it set back all those other games years and years and years, especially once it got to the point where EA was basically just sitting on the license and doing nothing with it. And then there's also on the season side type of racing games, you know, like a NASCAR and F1 game today, Electronic Arts signed the deal to get an exclusive NASCAR license, which was <laughs> directly the reason why things have gotten the way that they are there. Uh, you know, this was a time where you would have gone into the store and you would have had three different options for a NASCAR racing game, be it NASCAR Thunder, NASCAR Dirt to Daytona, or alternatively, if you want to go PC Sim Racing, NASCAR Racing 2003 season. Like, all three of those are, like, best-in-class games because they were all competing against one another. And then that went yoink right out the window. <laughs> right out the window. And now, because of that, well, why would you not sign an exclusive agreement if you were the racing series? And that's why there's no competition in that market and why those games will always be terrible. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Because there's one game I want to go ahead and talk about specifically. And this isn't me hating on this game. Do not get me wrong. Pump your brakes. Check yourself before you wreck yourself down in that comment section. That game is Need for Speed Underground 2. In my opinion, Underground 2 is by far the most important PlayStation 2 era title, a game that forever changed the world of racing games for one reason that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. Map design. This wasn't the first open world racing game. It wasn't even the first open world racing game of this era. However, when I think about open world racing games before Underground 2, I think of cities. For example, the Midtown Madness games and Midnight Club. They were always replicating a real-world city, just kind of shrunken down, scaled down, but it was still a city. And while the same is true for Underground 2, it's very, very different, which enabled it to do the things that it did with the gameplay. Because Underground 2 didn't give a hoot about trying to make a city in some capacity, 
you end up with a map that can fit a whole bunch of environments and a whole different bunch of events. You know, you had your twisty mountainous section, you had the industrial area, the downtown urban zone, the rich people area, the airport, the racetrack. The city made no sense in any reasonably realistic fashion. It doesn't even attempt to make sense. The downtown area is like four blocks, but the city has skyscrapers. It doesn't make sense for anything other than gameplay. Because if you want to have all those different types of events to keep the player engaged and have a bunch of different variety in the game, you need areas for them. And if you don't want a map that's so large that it's just a pain in the backside at that point, you really need to cram stuff in, and cram stuff in they did. And when I say what I'm about to say, I don't mean this as a criticism of Need for Speed Underground 2 or Most Wanted or any of the games around this time in this era. Because it's not fair to say that the game was so good that it was so influential, therefore it sucks. That's not what I'm doing. I really liked this game. I had it on PC, I had it on PS2. Like, I actually bought it on two different platforms. I liked it that much. However, Underground 2 killed off the unique environment racing game. You know, classic Need for Speed, games like Hot Pursuit 2 and earlier, always had tracks that were set in a unique environment that was special and crafted just for that one track. When you move to something like Underground, where you have a city environment, but you're trying to cram everything in, there's much more limitations put on it in terms of what can actually be done in terms of artistry and have it make any sort of sense. And I actually believe that this is one of the big reasons why Need for Speed Most Wanted famously has a piss filter applied to it. Because what's an easy way to make everything look cohesive? Just paint it yellow. I would almost equate Underground 2 to being basically the Call of Duty 4 of the racing game. Where if you're familiar with that game, Call of Duty 4 came out and then all of a sudden it became a massive, massive thing. And then next thing you know, every single first person shooter for 10, 15 years was shoehorning in a class system and perks and all this other stuff. Even when it didn't even make sense because that was just the feature that you were expected to have at that point. I don't want to get bogged down in the weeds here, but more or less... Five corporations run the world around us these days, thanks to consolidation, and it's the exact same with racing games. And it happens through some reasons. Big players are big players, therefore they can do big player things. Then you also have the fact that, well, the money's flowing to elsewhere, and there's other shifting interests, as well as there was no one there to stop them. I think really you have to start with the big players in the scene, because they're the ones that had all the money to go with the games. And a good game doesn't happen without money. It, games development is very expensive and it's only getting worse. But way back when, back in the original Xbox days, Microsoft had Project Gotham Racing, which while it was a good series, a good franchise, it never reached the same heights as Sony's Gran Turismo, which obviously if you're a Microsoft person, that would be a problem, right? So they would basically straight up yoink the Gran Turismo secret formula to create Forza, and from there on, Project Gotham Racing was more or less on the clock. Once PGR stalled out and faltered, why wouldn't Microsoft basically make the guaranteed successful arcade-style racing game and follow the trend that was set forth with Underground 2? And alas, we have Forza Horizon, which is that game. And then there was the third biggest player in the market, that being Electronic Arts. Need for Speed used to be a fantastic franchise. It used to be like one step below Gran Turismo and Forza. Like, if you wanted a good racing game, a Need for Speed game was always the way to go. And it was up until around this era. You know, with Underground 2, Most Wanted, Carbon, I think it was the one after that. Like, they were legitimately good games. However, same with the Burnout series. Legitimately good games. Being with EA at this time ended up creating, well, just too much not enough time in the oven, just poorly thought out concepts and just mush. And you end up with oversaturation as well as it tarnishes the brand to the point where Need for Speed will never be the same brand it was before Need for Speed got pooped on by Electronic Arts. Because, you know, they're Electronic Arts, that's what they do. What about those plucky little people known as Rockstar? <laughs> All right. Midnight Club and Smuggler's Run, great racing franchises back in the day. Well, 
they don't need to make those games because why would they make those games? Either one of those games would be just a small snippet of what the giant juggernaut known as Grand Theft Auto can provide. It would make no sense whatsoever to make either one of those games today because there's nothing good that can happen to them. I don't like it any more than you do, but like it just doesn't make any sense just because of where they've gone now. So what about Codemasters? All right, they were they were definitely really big, and they're still really big. I'm going to disregard the F1 series that they got going on, as well as Dirt Rally. We'll talk about both of those a little bit later on in this video. Simply put, Codemasters has never been one to really push things forward. Their games have always been racing games for people who like racing games, and they've always been good racing games because that's what they really specialized in. But it's hardly the stuff that's really going to wow people and blow them away unless they really like these types of games to begin with. You got some other games out there that I want to go ahead and talk about real quick. First of all, Test Drive Unlimited, a fantastic game that never really got the push that it deserved thanks to being with a dying publisher that was basically never able to put the money behind the game to get the game out there. The MX vs. ATV series, those games were always fantastic, right? Well, they went through like four publishers, I think. It was always one of those things where it seemed to always be shifting hands because everyone knew it was valuable and it was a good series, but... There was never really the, the substantial push behind it. And the last series I want to go ahead and bring up here, probably far lower down on the spectrum here, but it's a personal favorite of mine, the Tokyo Extreme Racer series. I don't know why they did this, but they renamed it moving on to the Xbox 360 into Import Tuner Challenge, at least here in North America. And I think this is a case of Tokyo Extreme Racer was a terrible name to begin with and very 90s. But then in the mid 2000s, it was like, okay, well, let's change it to something else because, you know, that'll do better in the market. So they paired up with Import Tuner of the magazine and like, oh, hey, yeah, that makes sense, right? You know, it works. However, like I never got the memo, so I never actually bought that game because I didn't know it was Tokyo Extreme Racer 4 as well as Import Tuner Challenge just sounds like racing game shovelware anyway, so like I don't think the pros outweighed the cons, and I think they also kind of shot themselves in the foot with the people that would have actually been like, Tokyo Extreme Racer, yes! So, <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying it would still be around if they didn't change the name, but, you know, it probably didn't help. Now, you remember how I said way back at the beginning of the video, racing is simple, and because of that, racing has always had cutting-edge experience of video games? You know, the graphics have always been a key factor, and that can't be forgotten. While it may not be the reason that I play these games, and it's probably not the reason that you play these games, it's something that is very important in the mainstream. However, the rest of the world caught up. Gran Turismo no longer looks so mind-blowingly visually amazing compared to the competition that it is a must-play game just to make your eyes bleed from all the beauty of the pixels on screen. That automatic selling factor of, yeah, look at how good the graphics can possibly be on this system is no longer nearly as much of a factor when every single first party developed game on either console looks just as good, more or less. I'm gonna go off script here and change directions as originally planning. I wanna talk about Gran Turismo 7 because this is a perfect example and yeah. So I don't have any way of recording consoles, the current consoles. I have to use an emulator for the older stuff. But I do have a PlayStation 4. I did play Gran Turismo 7. And honestly, as someone who's a long-term fan of Gran Turismo 7, playing through the single-player experience, I honestly felt insulted. I don't mean this as in like the game said something about me or disrespected my family or anything like that. I mean insulted as a fan of the series, as someone who sat through delay after delay after delay of every single Gran Turismo game like ever being pushed back years that I was playing a game that was so blissfully unaware and just didn't care. I honestly got to the point where I couldn't tell if Gran Turismo 7 was making fun of Gran Turismo like it was a parody of itself which is a really weird thing to have happen with a video game, to say the least. Especially one that clearly tries as hard as Gran Turismo clearly does. A lot has been said about scrapping the classic event structure that Gran Turismo had in favor of the GT Cafe, and I 100% agree that it is just a negative game design decision and trying to reinvent the wheel for no real particular reason. 
I say that as someone who, like many of you guys, likes racing games. However, you know how I said that the game felt like is insulting me and it was a parody of itself? If you don't like racing games, the game design of Gran Turismo 7 is actually perfect. The reason why the GT Cafe is the only thing in the single player experience in Gran Turismo, or at least it was way back when, I'm pretty sure it hasn't changed since I last played that game, I don't particularly care, is because of the fact that Polyphony Digital only cares about car porn because they know that car porn is the most important thing to their game. So they created a mode and made the gameplay to suit shoving all these renders and animations in front of you and look at all the details in our 3D model and how clean and crisp the paint looks and all this stuff every single time they can. That's the whole entirety of the goal of Gran Turismo 7, to make you look at the graphics, to blow your mind, and make sure that you know that they care about cars, so they put in all of the details that they possibly could. And from that standpoint, the game design is actually brilliant. But the problem is that makes a very terrible racing game. And this isn't just a Sony, you know, polyphony, Gran Turismo issue. You know, Forza, Microsoft, Turn 10, they're having to play the same game too because everybody has to play that same game. You know, they have to keep up with one another because if they don't, they'll be caught slipping and you can't have the competition looking better, especially when it comes to these flagship titles with a very long history. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, you'll know that I'm a sim racing guy. That's what I'm into. That's what I've posted traditionally. And that's what I probably will post in the future. I haven't even mentioned sim racing at all this entire video, unless you're one of those people that's like, oh, Gran Turismo is a sim, Forza is a sim, which I'm not even getting into that debate. They didn't start off that way, in my opinion, so I don't view them that way, even though that's an outdated viewpoint. But anyways, the reason I, I wait till now is because a lot of people are moving over to sim racing. For a very long time, throughout basically the entirety, up till the last several years, sim racing has always been a niche thing for us weirdos who are really into racing and care about the little things that make it different than, you know, a racing game. I'm not saying this, like, from an elitist point of view. It's just a different area of the racing game genre that traditionally was isolated and did its own thing and for a very long time has done its own thing separate and independently for better and for worse. I honestly believe the rising popularity of sim racing is 100% down to the fact that people are tired of playing the same racing game in a different guise enough to put up with the jank that comes from these really complex games from small studios that can't fix everything in an oversaturated market. All right, wrapping things up here, I want to circle back to the very start when I said racing games are simple. Because racing games are simple, they were able to look amazing and create mind-blowing experiences for whatever time they were in. However, that has changed. No longer is simply throwing all the graphics money at it enough to make a game that looks so much amazingly better than any other game out there. Everyone is going to pick it up simply to see the maximum cutting edge visual capability that whatever piece of hardware you have can put out. But that isn't the case anymore. That hasn't been the case for a very long time. And because of that, development needs to change. Priorities need to change. And unfortunately, they darn sure haven't changed by the people that actually have the money and effort to make that change, which is why you see a rise in the popularity of sim racing, indie titles, whatever you want to say is out there, alternative racing games from the mainstream, because those are the only games left that actually seem to care about racing games, which leaves us in a very weird state where here we are. <laughs> Anyways, that is just my opinion. Hope you guys enjoyed. Right, bye.